Hi everyone. Today in this video, let us discuss about the anticholinergics. What is the mechanism, action, side effects, and clinical use of anticholinergics? We have so many types of anticholinergics like the atropine, hyoscine. Both of these drugs are coming from the natural source. Similarly, dicyclobine, propanthaline, clidinium bromide. All these three drugs are acting like antispasmodics. Cyclopentolate and tropicamide, which are acting like midriatics. Ipratropium and tiotropium, which are used as bronchodilators. Darifinacin, tolterodine, oxybutynin, flavoxate. All these are acting like bladder relaxants. And pyrangipine, propanthaline, glycopyrrolate, acting like anti ulcer agents. Finally, benzhexol and benzotropin are acting like anti Parkinsonian agents. And one of the drug orphanadrine is centrally acting to decrease the muscle pain. In our previous video, we have already discussed all these anticholinergic drugs. And today in this video, let us discuss how they are going to act and what is the pharmacology of these anticholinergics. How they act? Now let us see how these anticholinergics are going to act. Anticholinergics are mainly acting at the muscanic receptors. So at the cholinergic nerve terminus on the post-synaptic membrane, the seven transmembrane G protein coupled receptors are present, which are nothing but the muscanic receptors. They may be either M1, M3, or M5. These muscanic receptors are G protein coupled receptors. They are coupled with the three subunits alpha, beta, and gamma. Now, the acetyl choline, which is present in the synaptic vesicles, can be released by exocytosis. So, when the calcium is going to enter into the presynaptic nerve terminal, the nerve terminal is going to be depolarized resulting in the release of the acetyl choline and this acetyl choline can act on the muscanic receptors now when it is acting on m1 m3 or m5 it can act through the alpha subunit such that it is going to stimulate the phospholipase c system when this phospholipase c is going to be activated it can cleave the phosphatidyl inostal biphosphate into two components one is the ip3 inostal triphosphate and second was the dag diacyl glycerol this diacyl glycerol can further activate the protein kinase c which are going to open the inward going calcium channels so through these calcium channels now the calcium can enter into the post synaptic membrane and IP3 can directly increase the release of the calcium from the internal stores. In this way, the calcium levels are going to be increased within the postsynaptic membrane. This calcium is responsible for few of the cellular actions. For example, within the CNS, it produces excitation. On the smooth muscle, it produces a contraction. Now, the anticholinergics can act as antagonists at the muscanic receptors. They can block the muscanic receptors, thereby they inhibit the action of this acetyl choline. In this way, anticholinergics can block the M1, M3 or M5 receptors. Now, let us see the action of these anticholinergics on the other types of muscanic receptors. At few of the organs, we can observe another type of uh, G protein coupled receptors, which are the M2 or M4 receptors. These are the muscanic acetyl choline receptors. And again, they are the G protein coupled receptors associated with the three subunits alpha, beta, gamma. But M2 and M4 are inhibitory in nature and they produce an inhibitory response through the alpha subunit. So when this acetyl choline is going to be released by the exocytosis, it can act on this M2 or M4 receptors. And it acts through the alpha subunit which is inhibitory in nature. Normally this alpha subunit is going to convert the ATP into cyclic AMP by activation of the adenylyl cyclase system. But M2 and M4 receptors are inhibitory in nature. So this adenylyl cyclase is going to be inhibited such that the ATP is not converted into cyclic AMP, which results in the decreased cyclic AMP levels within the postsynaptic membrane. Now, as the cyclic AMP levels are going to decrease, the protein kinase activation is going to be decreased, which results in the decreased levels of the calcium within the postsynaptic membrane. Calcium is very important for contraction of the heart. So when the calcium levels are going to be reduced, the heart is unable to contract, resulting in the decreased rate as well as force of contraction. And these M2 and M4 receptors can also act through the beta gamma subunit, which are going to open the potassium channels. When these potassium channels are going to open, these channels are outward going so that the potassium is going outside, resulting in the hyperpolarization. In this way, M2 and M4 receptors are mainly produce the inhibitory response. Now the anticholinergics can again block these M2 or M4 receptors, thereby they prevent the inhibitory response produced by acetylcholine. 
in this way most of the anticholinergics are non selective they can block any type of muscarinic receptors but m1 m3 m5 are excitatory in nature and m2 and m4 are inhibitory in nature so anticholinergics can inhibit the excitatory response mediated by m1 m3 m5 and they can prevent the inhibitory response produced by m2 and m4 now let us see the farm class actions now let us see what is the effect of these anticholinergics on the different types of organs so let us start with the first one heart what is the action of these anticholinergics on the heart on the heart m2 receptors are present now the anticholinergics are going to block the m2 receptors these m2 receptors are inhibitory in nature so normally they are going to decrease the rate as well as force of contraction and since the anticholinergics are going to block this m2 receptors they can increase the rate of contraction so that's why anticholinergics can produce the tachycardia as one of the side effect so atropine is one of the drug which can produce a tachycardia and since it is going to produce a tachycardia this drug can be used in the treatment of sinus bradycardia so he, here we should not confuse that atropine produce the tachycardia that's why it is indicated for the bradycardia second one is on the eye again the smooth muscles of the eye are equipped with the m3 receptors now the anticholinergics are going to block these m3 receptors which are excitatory in nature and responsible for the pupillary constriction since anticholinergics are going to block these m3 receptors they produce the pupillary dilatation that's why these drugs are going to produce a midriasis and they can be used as midriatics particularly cyclopentalate and tropicamide are used as midriatics and they can also produce a cycloplegia cycloplegia is the paralysis of accommodation the vision is going to be fixed at a particular distance and it is not responding to the release of the acetylcholine as the anticholinergics are going to block the cholinergic receptors so particularly atropine is one of the drug which produce the both midriasis as well as the cycloplegia whenever both of these actions are required we can use the atropine particularly in the children during the eye examination cycloplegic effect is required in order to fix the vision to a particular distance so atropine can be administered in the children for eye examination but whenever we require only pupillary dilatation cyclopentalate and tropicamide can be used as midriatics and because of the pupillary dilatation as well as cycloplegia the anticholinergics can increase the intraocular pressure which may precipitate the glaucoma in susceptible patients so anticholinergic should be carefully given in the patients who are having the increased intraocular pressure third one is the bladder again the bladder is equipped with the m3 receptors now the anticholinergics are going to block the m3 receptors thereby they produce a relaxation of the bladder and this results in the decrease in the urination as well as frequency of urination that's why these drugs are used in the treatment of urinary incontinence so in those patients who are unable to control the urination these anticholinergics can be given as bladder relaxants and since they are going to decrease the urination these drugs can produce the urinary retention as one of the side effect we have few other drugs like the darifenacin as well as solifenacin which are the two selective m3 blockers which can be used as bladder relaxants and other drugs like the tolteridine oxybutynin and flavoxate are the non selective anticholinergics which again used as bladder relaxants next one is the git the git is equipped with the different types of muscarinic receptors it is equipped with the m1 m3 as well as m2 receptors so mixed effects can be observed at the gi tract so one of the important effect of anticholinergics is to decrease the gi motility normally acetylcholine can increase the gi motility so the anticholinergics can decrease the gi motility since they are going to decrease the motility of the gi tract they can be used as anti spasmodics because they produce a relaxation of the gi smooth muscle and the gastric parietal cells the m1 receptors are present which are responsible for the gastric acid secretion so anticholinergics can also decrease the acid secretion thereby they can be used as anti ulcer agents but these drugs can decrease the acid secretion that is stimulated by parasympathetic system only normally the gastric acid secretion can be stimulated by mediators like the histamine or gastrin which is not controlled by anticholinergics and here we can also find one of the side effects of anticholinergics since the anticholinergics are going to decrease the gi motility they can produce one of the side effect constipation next one is the lungs lungs are equipped with the m3 receptors so when these m3 receptors are going to be blocked they produce the bronchodilatation particularly we have drugs like the ipratropium and tiotropium which produce a bronchodilatation that's why these drugs can be used in the treatment of copd 
chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. And anticholinergics can also increase the mucociliary clearance, but this action is mainly observed with the atropine. Ipratropium and diatropium are not showing this mucociliary clearance, but atropine is only showing the mucociliary clearance. Next one is the glandular secretions. Normally, acetylcholine is going to increase the glandular secretions through the M3 receptors. Now, the anticholinergics are going to block the M3 receptors, thereby they inhibit the glandular secretions. Particularly, the lacrimal secretion is going to be inhibited, which results in the blurred vision because the lacrimal fluid is important for the lubrication of the eye. Similarly, they can decrease the salivary secretion, which results in the dry mouth. And they can also decrease the sweat secretion, which may result in the hyperthermia. This hyperthermia is observed with the anticholinergics at a toxic dose because they are going to inhibit the sweat secretion. Even the sweat glands are connected with the sympathetic system, but the receptors are cholinergic receptors. That's why anticholinergics can block these cholinergic receptors, thereby they can decrease the sweat secretion. So here all of these three pharmacological actions are mainly observed as the side effects of anticholinergics. And finally the central actions. So one of the drugs is the hyoscine which can decrease the emesis. That's why it is used as an anti-emetic. And few of the anticholinergics can decrease the EPS, extra pyramidal side effects that are produced by antipsychotics. So particularly the two drugs like benzotropin and benzohexol are used to decrease the extra pyramidal side effects. And M1 receptors are present within the CNS which are responsible for the increase in the memory. And when these receptors are going to be blocked, the anticholinergics can decrease the memory which may result in the dementia, loss of memory. Hyosin is one of the drugs which can produce the dementia. And similarly, they can produce a CNS excitation. This CNS excitation results in the agitation, hyperactivity, disorientation, and at a very toxic dose, they can also produce a hyperthermia. So here we have two important beneficial action at the central level. They can be used as anti-emetics as well as they can be used as anti-Parkinsonian agent to decrease the extra pyramidal side effects. Now let us see what are the side effects of the anticholinergics. Four important side effects we have to always remember. The first one is the dry mouth. This is because of the inhibition of the salivary secretion. Blood vision because of inhibition of lacrimal secretion. Constipation because of decrease in the GA motility. And urinary retention because of the bladder relaxation. These are the four important side effects of the anticholinergics. And they can also produce a tachycardia because they are going to block the M2 receptors. And at toxic dose, they can produce restlessness, agitation, hyperthermia, and disorientation in the patients. Clinical uses. So anticholinergics are used in the various clinical conditions. They can be used as pre-anastics. Particularly atropine and hyosin can be used as pre-anastics in order to decrease the secretions. And they can be used as antispasmodics. We have so many types of drugs like the dicyclomine, propanthaline, clidinium bromide. They can be used as antispasmodics. Midriatics, cyclopentlate and tropicamide mainly used as midriatics. But if cycloplegia is required, atropine can be used as a midriatic. They can be used as bladder laxants, particularly darifenacin, solifenacin, tolterodine, oxybutynin. All these drugs can be used as bladder laxants in the treatment of urinary incontinence. As bronchodilators, particularly in the treatment of COPD, we have two drugs like the iprotropium and diotropium. They can also be used as anti-emetics. Hyosin is used as an anti-emetic in the treatment of motion sickness. As an anti ulcer agents like glycopyrrolate, propanthaline, and pyrangepine can be used. Anti-Parkinsonian agents, benzhexol and benzotropin can be used. Finally, for treatment of sinus bradycardia, atropin can be used as well as in the treatment of physostigmine poisoning. Physostigmine is a acetylcholine esterase inhibitor which increase the acetylcholine levels, thereby increase the muscanic actions. And for this physostigmine poisoning, we can use the atropine. So these are the various clinical use of the anticholinergics. So that's about the pharmacology of anticholinergics. We have number of drugs acting like anticholinergics, but many of these anticholinergics are non-selective. They can block any type of muscanic receptors. M1, M3, M5 are excitatory in nature and M2 and M4 are inhibitory in nature. So now these anticholinergics can inhibit both excitatory as well as inhibitory response mediated by these muscanic receptors. Because of their wider actions on the muscanic receptors, these drugs are used in the multiple clinical conditions. So that's for today. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel. 
share this video with your friends post your comments in the comment box thank you for watching this video